All right, everybody. Um, we are going to start our new unit today um, on the ancient Mediterranean. So we're going to be focusing primarily on the civilizations that are um, surrounding what is now called the Mediterranean Sea. So one of the first areas that begins to be populated by these more concentrated human populations is called Mesopotamia. So starting around 3500 BCE, so that's 5500 years ago, um, we had these um, city-states beginning to take root in modern-day Iran and Iraq. We refer to this area as the Fertile Crescent. It's, it's somewhat of a crescent shape. Um, there's plenty of water, sun, and natural resources in these areas. You'll also notice that there is a proximity to salt water as well as fresh water. We have the Tigris and Euphrates River in particular right here that are making this area have very rich soil that's perfect for farming and early agriculture. So the coastline used to be a little bit further out. Um, the coastline has since receded. Um, in any case, this is where we see a lot of what are what is acknowledged now to be humankind's first. So we see the first known writing here. We see the first known cities and urbanization, um, organized religion, uh, organized laws and government. We see the use of the wheel, and we also see agriculture. So there's a lot of really important stuff that's happening in this area. So there were many, many different civilizations and groups that occupied this area. We focus on four of them in APR history, Sumer, Babylon, Assyria, and Persia. So what you have to imagine is that in this area thousands of years ago, like people were looking for places that were relatively easy to farm. They weren't going to like start a civilization in the middle of the desert and then bring stuff there. That doesn't make sense. So what they did is that they they fought over these areas with, with lots of natural resources. And because of these resource rich areas and the relative scarcity of them, like you're gonna see civilizations taking over the same areas over and over and over again, particularly in ancient times. Um, ancient Mesopotamia is known for all of these like su successive civilizations building on top of one another. So we're seeing these vast empires that are constantly changing names, borders, and hands. So um, just to give you a little bit of background um, and to connect you to the global prehistory curriculum, um, these are some of the transitions that we're seeing from global prehistory. Um, basically, we're focusing more on humans and human activities and art. We're seeing city-states. Um, and then we're also seeing people that are going beyond creating art for art's sake. This is really important. We have these in, we have this, this division of labor that is happening. Um, when you urbanize and you have a bunch of people that are creating city-states, it is no longer necessary for everybody to be a farmer. Um, what ends up happening is that there's a class of people that are farmers and they produce enough food for everybody as well as enough surplus to trade with other neighboring communities so that they can obtain materials that are not local to the area. So what happens is that we end up getting the division of social classes and ultimately people in the upper classes notice that there's a couple of talented individuals that can represent their likeness in statues or paintings, etc. And they capitalize upon this ability to create images of themselves and to create these narratives that basically assure and guarantee their power. So we're going to see lots and lots of images of rulers, kings, etc., and deities. So the first of these civilizations is Sumer. Um, so Sumer is known for creating these complex irrigation system. They basically created these channels um, in the earth to get water from the Euphrates River to flood these these areas so that they didn't have to like carry water from one water source to the field. So it, it was particularly ingenious. Um, again, we have a specialization of labor um, because some people are farming, not everybody needs to be focused on food. So we have some people that are specializing in creating art or some that are occupying administrative roles. Um, so there were several independent city states within kind of like the, the mini kingdom of Sumer. Um, each of which was under the protection of one or more deities. So we have an organized uh, polytheistic religion. So members of the ruling task were typically 
um, or the ruling class were typically tasked with carrying out the gods' divine wills. Um, most of these Mesopotamian civilizations are operating under a theocracy. So basically you have the gods and then you have a small number of people that communicate with the gods and they're basically playing telephone saying, okay, the god Shamash wants us to do this, so we're going to do this thing now. So two archaeologically significant sites that are mentioned in the AP curriculum are Ur and Uruk. So you'll notice again that the, these river systems are providing like the, the backbone of this super important area right here. So the Sumerians built these gigantic temple complexes from mud brick. There is not a lot of stone that is naturally occurring in this geographical region, um, which is why a lot of the larger edifices are made out of mud brick. So mud brick is great. The only problem, though, is that it is particularly susceptible to crumbling uh, because it's mud. You add water to mud brick and it turns back into mud. So unfortunately a lot of the edifices from this time period are severely worn down or no longer exist. Um, however, um, even though there wasn't that much stone, there was a lot of there were a lot of trade networks that were bringing in these other materials from faraway lands. So things like stone, um, we also have semi-precious minerals, including lapis lazuli from As Afghanistan, and then from places like Lebanon, we're getting lots of different kinds of wood. The Sumerians are also um, credited with creating the first known writing system, which is called cuneiform. So cuneiform, we, we don't really, what's, what's funny about cuneiform is that a, most of the stuff that comes down to us is bookkeeping records, basically saying like person A traded this with person B. Like it, it's a lot of it's not like particularly interesting. Um, however, there are a couple of like, stories and fables and narrative that have been passed down through cuneiform. But most of the stuff that is found is basically like, this is what this person traded for that. There are also the cylinder seals that were made that could basically be rolled into clay to authenticate um, a, a trade agreement or some other such item. They're particularly commonly found in burial sites. Um, there's also a lot of evidence that the Sumerians enjoyed recreation and entertainment. There's um, a lot of stories, um, the most famous of which is the Epic of Gilgamesh, and then there have also been musical instruments found in burial sites. So this is an example of a harp. So this is our first AP artwork of the unit. It's referred to as the White Temple and ziggurat. So um, this is something that students get confused a lot. The ziggurat is this mud brick thing, like this platform that's being created. The temple is the thing at the top. So what it remains today are the foundations of the temple and the um, kind of like the worn away remains of the ziggurat. So the city of Uruk was again one of these architecturally significant sites in um, ancient Sumer. Um, and the city of Uruk was said to have been protected by the sky god Anu. So he was kind of like the roughly the Sumerian equivalent of Zeus. So it was this elevated structure about 40 feet tall at its zenith um, that was built in the center of the city so that Anu could descend and then communicate with the royal and clergy in the temple. So remember that this is a theocracy, a theocratic government, so there's a couple of people that are permitted to enter the temple and commune with the gods. So the temple itself is modestly sized. Um, this is not a place for congregational worship like we're used to in a lot of the monotheistic religions that are practiced today. This is not like a church. Um, this is not a like a like a mosque. It is a very kind of like small, more private and exclusive area for a certain member of a certain kind of like stock of the ruling class. So the temple was once coated with bitumen, which is sort of this waterproofing tar-like cement, which made it this gleaming white inside and out. So the inner temple or the temple also created or contained a cella or an inner area that had several rooms. And each of these rooms was somewhat private and it's there where the members of the ruling class would sit and then basically wait for the gods to manifest before them and tell them what to do. 
So another interesting feature of the ziggurat is that it had tapered sides. It's a little bit difficult to see in this image right here, but if you look in this image, you can see that like the sides are not per uh, exactly perpendicular with the ground. They kind of go at an angle. So you might recall that this is made of mud bricks. So if water sits on the surface too long, the entire structure is going to collapse in on, in on itself. So there were actually these slats that were carved into the sides of the ziggurat um, and these tapered sides to encourage the water to slide right off when it rained. There was also this terrace on the outside um, of the ziggurat right here um, that was large enough to conduct outdoor rituals. There are some figures here in this reconstruction to give you a sense of the scale and what the temple may have looked like. We don't even know if it had a roof or not. Like the only thing that remains are a couple of the foundations. So this is entirely speculative. These are examples of votive offerings that you might have found um, in these architecturally significant areas or these archeologically significant areas. Um, these are made of gypsum. So a lot of times, again, stone in this particular context had to be imported from elsewhere. So it cost a lot of money to get something like this commissioned. So hundreds of these kinds of statues have been found in temples. Um, these in particular were found buried beneath the floors. So most of them are between one and two feet high. A couple of them are um, around 30 inches high. Um, they were usually commissioned by donors to be placed in temples to pray for them in their absence. So again, we when we talk about like the White Temple in Ziggurat, like not the average person is not allowed to enter this temple. So oftentimes they would commission these proxies to pray in their place. So the in, there is usually an inscription at the base in cuneiform um, that would say something like it offers prayers. Um, or it would have the name of the patron who commissioned the sculpture. So there is some evidence that these statues were designed in the likenesses of their patrons. There are a couple of distinguishing features between all of the, the male appearing statues, for example. It's not like they're, they're carbon copies of each other. Um, each of these statuettes has their hands clasped in a praying position. Um, or close to one another, and almost all of them have this beaker, like a, some sort of glass um, that they that is usually for the purpose of libation. So libation is like a ritual hand washing or a ritual pouring of water. Um, there's some negative space that has been carved out between the legs, and sometimes you'll see it between the arms as well. Um, this is something that's a bit of a departure from a lot of the prehistoric statuary that we've seen. Um, this is a little bit more difficult to do and it requires more precise tools, so this is a pretty significant development. Um, you'll see in a lot of ancient Mesopotamian art that the men have these really long rippling beards. Um, they oftentimes also wear these knee length skirts. Women on the other hand have these robes that usually cover one shoulder. So what you also notice when you look at these figures is that they have these extremely large eyes. Um, so it's not like people from ancient Mesopotamia had gigantic eyeballs, as far as we know. Um, a lot of people theorize that the eyes were made large in these statues um, to symbolize eternal wakefulness. So this statue was always there, and it's always awake, and it's always devoting itself to prayer. Our next piece is called the Standard of Ur. Um, this piece was actually found in a royal cemetery um, in the royal tombs at Ur, so there were d distinct social classes, and if you were a really important person, then you were buried with lots of cool stuff. Um, oftentimes, the super rich and powerful would have servants sacrificed and then buried with them so that they could have people do stuff for them in the afterlife. <coughs> Excuse me. So this may have been a standard, which is basically an image that is stuck on a pole and um, carried during a military procession. There's also um, some resemblance to a, a musical instrument. So if you look at the, um, the harp from back here, they usually have this box shape um, as a base to them. So it could have been a base to a musical instrument as well. So this piece was certainly not the most lavish thing found in the tombs, but it is historically significant in that it shows a narrative. 
Um, it was made from very expensive imported materials, um, including red limestone and shell, as well as yeah, limestone shell and lapis lazuli, which is this blue in the background. So this stuff was not stuff that would occur naturally in the geography of this land, so it had to have been imported from elsewhere, which demonstrates evidence of extensive trade networks during this time. So the standard of Ur is not particularly long, it's about 20 inches long, um, and it displays this narrative in registers. So a register is basically a, a narrative band. So there are three registers in this image right here. The register here, a register here, and a register here. So we're going to see this term over and over again in, in ancient art, because it's a, a pretty frequently occurring narrative format. So um, this particular narrative reads from bottom to top. And there are two sides. We have one side that is frequently referred to as the war side, which is this one right here. And then the other side is referred to the peace side. So on the war side, we basically have this narrative of the Sumerian king. And of course, he is the tallest and most central figure in this narrative. Um, that is dismounting from his fancy chariot to inspect these prisoners that have been seized. So basically, um, the, the first thing that is happening is this conquest right here. We have the, this individual here in a chariot that is running over prisoners, and then the ones that, are, that survive are basically stripped and then taken to the king. On the peace side, we basically have preparations for a feast. We have all of these, these fancy items, perhaps war booty, um, or things that were seized, seized from the conquered people that are being brought to, like in a procession to the palace and being prepared for entertainment on the very top. Again, the king is the very tallest and the very largest figure. He is sitting and he's still taller than everybody else in this narrative right here. And then we also have some entertainment here. There's a guy with a, a harp. So um, you'll also notice that the um, figures and the animals are in twisted perspective, which is, again, this, this arrangement of the figures where you're seeing, like, composite features. It's not, like, a natural way for figures to be occurring in. So I have the war and the peace sides um, zoomed in for you here so that you can see them a little bit better. So, again, here's the king. Here's a chariot with wheels, which is an important development at this point in time. What's really interesting is this bottom register right here. I was reading recently and somebody noted that like these mules right here or horses, some sort of weight bearing animal, like their, their gates, like the distance between their legs increases. So we have them kind of like walking here and then they're moving their way up to a gallop and this, the, the gate is getting wider and wider. So there's almost like the suggestion of motion that is happening where they're starting off slow and then they're trotting and then they're getting faster. So it could be that this is like four separate like instances of, of people on chariots or it could be like this is step one, this is step two, this is step three, and this is step four and these are the same figures. Um, so whenever we see this like continuing um, action where there's a suggestion that like we're seeing the same figures over and over again. Um, this is called a continuous narrative. So basically think of it as a comic strip without the divisions between the sequences to show a progression of a narrative. So we'll see this pretty frequently in art history, so keep that term in mind. Here's the peace side. Here again is the king, and then here's the entertainment. Again, you'll notice the use of twisted perspective. You're seeing both feet when the figures are seated. You're also seeing um, the face in a profile view, everything except for the eyes, which are shown from a frontal view. Unfortunately, some of the inlay has been lost here, but a lot of the details still remain. So we don't really cover the Acadians. Um, but I wanted to bring up this statue because it shows evidence of a couple of things that are really important at this time. One of which is the use of metal casting. So, and that wasn't really e that wasn't really evident in any of the works from this unit. So I wanted to include it to show you that people have been using metals 
um, to create artwork as well as weapons for, for thousands of years, including in Mesopotamia. So this was an image that was likely of an Akkadian ruler. You'll notice that it's not in the state that it would have in, would have been made for intentionally. You can see, especially from the frontal view, that the eyes have been gouged out. Um, it's a little bit more subtle, but the beard has also been snapped off too. So again, this is a, a pretty, like, this is, an, this is a time that's fraught with conquest and people taking over the same lands um, and lands exchanging power and changing names over and over again over the course of thousands of years. So there's a lot of violence that's happening. Um, and particularly when a ruler is usurped um, or there's a coup or he is overthrown in some way, oftentimes a lot of the images that bear his likeness were destroyed. Um, or if they were particularly important materials in the eyes, like there could have been some sort of precious stone inlay in the eyes, they were oftentimes like gouged out to, to get to those precious materials in there. So whenever you see an image that um, within its own context would have been significant, like either a ruler or a deity or other, like some sort of important figure and it's been destroyed. We call that iconoclasm. So iconoclasm is something that we'll see over and over again in art history. Um, basically, it's just evidence of some sort of deliberate destruction, uh, particularly in artwork. We're going to be moving on to Babylonia. Um, in terms of time, it didn't really last that long as an empire. King Hammurabi was basically the the, the guy that that made the Babylonian Empire happen in its first installment, and, its first, and as soon as he died, um, the Babylonian Empire kind of dissolved. There was a brief resurgence of the Babylonian Empire about a thousand years after its initial inception. Uh, of course, a lot of stuff is carrying over from the Sumerians in terms of architecture, religious traditions, and so on. So remember that Sumer was this tiny little area right here. We have now expanded many folds to include a pretty broad region that spans um, five seas, basically, as well as a lot of these important waterways. So King Hammurabi, what is perhaps the most famous Mesopotamian ruler known today, um, he is best known for creating this set of state ordained laws that focused on like if you do something bad then something equally bad is going to happen to you. You probably recognize the phrase eye for an eye that comes from King Hammurabi's code. Um, for a time Babylon was likely the largest city in the world um, having a little under a quarter million people in it which was massive for this time. So the city of Babylon was rebuilt about, again about a thousand years after its initial conception, um, and this is what this is a reconstruction of that rebuilding right here. So the gates of Ishtar are particularly famous. There's a reconstruction of them in Germany um, in one of these museums right here. If you've also been to RISD, Rhode Island School of Design, um, there is a recreation of the Ishtar gates in one of the the, um, the outdoor areas. So there was also this massive ziggurat. Um, that was about 250 feet tall, and this was actually said to be the origins of the biblical narrative of Babel, which was this, this massive tower that was basically the this initiating event where, where people said, oh, we're going to build a tower to heaven, and then God was like, how about you don't, and then made everybody speak different languages. So this, this narrative was based off of the city's massive ziggurat. So here's the Ishtar gates. Again, we're seeing twisted perspective feature pretty prominently. So this is our Babylonian artwork, the steel of Hammurabi. So remember that steel is a, a word that is basically referring to a fancy rock. So this is basalt, which is a sort of volcanic stone. So this was set up in Babylon. And of course, like when people go in and conquer stuff, they take it and they move it elsewhere. So an Elamite king took the steel from Babylon and then brought it to Susa. So the text um, that has been inscribed on the stone is in the Akkadian language. There's 51 columns of text um, in which there are inscribed about 300 laws, and these laws are Hammurabi's law code. 
So there is interestingly some use of foreshortening in the image up here. It is quite subtle. Um, but this is basically the ground level right here and the throne as well as the beard of the, um, the, the King Shamash are at a slight angle. They're not entirely parallel with the ground level here. So it's almost suggesting that this is going back into space rather than being completely flattened. Additionally, we have the figure of Hammurabi here who is being presented with a measuring rod and a coiled rope. Um, by the god Shamash. So Shamash here is wearing this crown with four rows of horns. His beard is longer and fuller than Hammurabi's, indicating his status. And even though he's sitting, he's just a little bit taller than Hammurabi. Again, we're seeing this hierarchy of scale here. Hammurabi has a speaking gesture. Um, typically, that means like a hand close to the mouth. Um, and we have this notion of theocracy here. Again, we have the gods telling important mortals what to do, and then those mortals then tell everybody else what to do. So what Shamash is doing here is he's presenting Hammurabi with the tools to construct and maintain social order. Now moving on to Assyria. So of the four civilizations that we cover. The Assyrians were perhaps the most militant. Um, you might call them Spartan in nature. Um, Assyrian society really revolved around the military um, and they were extremely re aggressive in their tactics. So again, we have original like Sumer right here and then the Babylonian Empire at its resurgence taking over about this much area and now we're expanding even into um, Egypt. So they were extremely aggressive in their tactics. Um, oftentimes they would um, terrorize or terrify their victims into submission. One particular tactic is that they would go into a small town and like kill everybody in it and burn it to the ground. And then the other surrounding towns would hear about it and they would be they would surrender. So this was a way that the Assyrians could basically ensure that they didn't lose as many soldiers. So, of course, if you're going around and conquering everybody that you possibly can, you're going to be taking all their stuff and you're going to be amassing considerable wealth. So there was a lot of, of capital that was obtained from these conquests that was then put into the construction of palaces as well as art within those palaces. A lot of times the kings chose to have themselves depicted as these like very masculine, stoic, figures. Um, King Ashurbanipal in particular um, was known for his his desire to have himself depicted as this like very manly guy. There's these beautiful narrative release sculptures inside of his palace that show him hunting lions. And what's interesting is that like he and these these guys that he's hunting with have these very stoic faces, but the artist has taken particular care to to depict a lot of emotion on the lions. So um, this was like one of the ways that the Assyrian kings would kind of like affirm their masculinity. They would have these controlled environments and they'd have these wild animals brought into them and then they would hunt them within the controlled environment to basically show everybody how, how cool they were. So the piece from the Assyrians that we cover are Lamassu. So if you've ever driven past the Citadel um, on the way to the airport, um, LAX, then you've probably seen this form before, this like winged bull with a man's head. Um, if you drive past the Citadel in, in Southern California, you'll see them on these giant pillars. So these real Lamassu um, that were built in the citadel of Sargon II um, were almost 14 feet tall, um, and they were actually constructed elsewhere and then hauled to the citadel using ropes and sled, sled, sleds. So this feat was so noteworthy that there are actually narrative relief sculptures that depict this event happening. One interesting feature of the Lamassu um, besides the obvious chimerism, is the fact that these statues have five legs. One, two, three, four, five. So when you look at these statues from the front, as you can see in this one right here, you can see both of the legs standing in the front. 
Whereas if you were to look at these statues from the side, you can only see four legs. So this was kind of like artistic problem solving in the sense that like you couldn't really hollow out the space right here. It wouldn't be structurally sound. It wouldn't be weight bearing if you did that. And also if you were in the front and you saw that your Lamassu only had one leg, it, it wouldn't project that image of power and stoutness and solidity. So this was kind of a way for them to, for the artists to show this particular creature from multiple angles in a way that they thought was the most accurate. So there were two of these Lamassu um, that were in this particular citadel, um, and they were intended to support the gate as well as protect the seven-walled citadel that they were installed in. So the Assyrians were super paranoid. Um, they basically knew that, like, if there were was a well-coordinated effort, that all of their hard work could be for nothing. So there's a notion here, when you look at the, the design motifs within these Lamassu, that this repetition, we have this same form that is used for the feathers, um, these same forms that are used for the, these patterned bits of hair along the sides and in the beard. This really conveys a sense of like harmony and stability. Also, too, they're 14 feet tall. You can imagine that as you're coming up to the walls of the Citadel, you're seeing these massive statues that are almost three times the height of the average man at the time. So they're intended to be apotropaic. So apotropaic is this fancy word that basically means having the power to ward off evil or bad luck. The last civilization that we cover with regard to ancient Mesopotamia is Persia, or the Achaemenid Empire. So the Achaemenid Empire absorbed Babylon, and it was absolutely massive. So again, we have Sumer right here, Babylon, which is like, eh. And then we had the Assyrians, which was like this. And then Persia is expanding even further east. And a lot of historians theorize that had the Greeks not defeated them, then they would have expanded even further. So this was the largest empire to have ever existed at its time. Uh, and a lot of what we know about Persia actually comes from the Greeks. So you'll notice that they're pretty close to modern day Greece right here. Um, and they did occupy a lot of these areas that are part of modern day Greece. There was a lot of tension between these two communities, um, some of which you may have observed in the movie 300, which is this fictitious account of this, of this battle between the Persians and in particular the Spartans. So um, the Persian Empire was multi-ethnic and in relative terms extremely tolerant of the conquered peoples, faiths, languages, and political structures. They didn't basically say you have to become exactly like us. They said, you know, it's fine, continue doing what you're doing, but every year we want a tribute from you, basically to signify your loyalty and as kind of like an insurance policy. So when we look at the audience hall of Darius and Xerxes and all the associated structures, you're actually going to see um, members of these, of these nations that are offering tributes to the Persian kings. So um, the Persian Empire was eventually um, toppled by Alexander the Great, who out of respect and formality, formality to legitimize his control over the empire actually buried the last Persian king in this massive tomb. So according to the Greeks, the Persians liked to party. So this information is a little bit biased because of like particular circumstances, but this was an example of serving where that was found in one of these treasuries um, of the king. So basically they would invite everybody over to their palace and then serve them food and stuff on these in these cups and these plates made of solid gold. Like you can again imagine like the more area that you're covering, the more resources that you are also obtaining. So this is an extremely wealthy empire. So this is the audience hall or Apadana of Darius and Xerxes. It was built, um, it was added to over several successive generations by different Persian kings. Um, so it was not all built in one generation. It's this massive complex um, that consists of many different buildings. Um, it was 
built on a, a plateau that was overlooking a plain. So again, we're seeing this habit of people to build important stuff in high places. The audience hall or the Apadana was intended to basically awe and impress. Like it was this massive space that was used for festivals and receptions and around 10,000 people could stand inside the audience hall just on its own. So again, this is the Abadana or audience hall right here. A little bit over 100 by 100 meters. So there were originally 72 columns inside of the audience hall. Only 14 of them remain standing today. And these columns were almost 65 feet high. So this was extremely tall for this time. And to add kind of like to the impressiveness of this, remember that this area is not particularly rich in stone materials. So all of this stone pretty much had to be sourced from elsewhere. So they had to pay vast amounts of money to get the stone to build this place from elsewhere. So that's also attesting to the wealth and, and lavishness of the Persian Empire. So each of these columns had a capital. We're going to see this word over and over again too. A capital is basically a column topper. Um, and these columns um, typically had this design motif of like the head, shoulders, and, and front part of the body of animals like bulls um, or eagles or griffins. So the roof, of course, is no longer there. Um, it was made of timber, and the timber itself was imported from Lebanon. So again, they had to cart it from hundreds of miles away to get it here. And it was sealed with plaster to keep the, the spaces between the timbers tight. Um, there are also these relief sculptures on the terrace and stairs on the outside of the audience hall that are particularly famous. And they depict this procession of Persian nobles, dignitaries, and guards, as well as members of these 23 subject nations that are bearing items from their lands to the Persian king as tributes. So what's super interesting is that each of these um, members of the tribute nations, they're all dressed in such a way and their, their hair and beards are arranged in such a way that say like this person is from this area, this person is from that area. So what this is conveying essentially is that this is a very cosmopolitan but organized and structured empire. Um, there's a harmony and stability and a coexistence that is suggested um, in this coexistence of these of these figures, but still like the Persian Empire has absolute power. So Alexander the Great, when he came in and he conquered um, the Persian Empire around 330 BCE, basically ordered the audience hall. Um, and the rest of this complex to be raised to the ground to signify like the fall. And of course, the, the Persians then invaded Athens and then destroyed the Acropolis. So we'll talk about that in a couple of days. So these are some computer generated reconstructions of the audience hall from multiple angles. This is the, that stairway that was pictured here on this slide. And again, you, it's really difficult to get a sense of how big and how grand this place was because it's not much more than foundations and a couple of columns nowadays. Um, but hopefully these reconstructions give you a sense of the scale and the awe that people would have felt when they came into this area. So again, several different buildings and complexes. This is an aerial view of the, the ground plan of this particular structure. So um, whenever you see a circle inside of these walls right here, that means a column. So this is the audience hall of Darius and Xerxes today right here. Again, not many of the original columns remain. You can see a couple of people um, visiting the site to give you a sense of the scale. There's some reconstruction that is happening over here. And here again is that aerial view of that ground plan that's right here.